say this is the Justice Dialogue. Um, we're dedicated to talking about issues of environmental, social, political, economic justice. Um, when the occupation started, we chose to do this, and we're going to keep it going as long as the occupation is going, maybe even longer. Um, and today we're going to have Albert Brown addressing the ethics and principles of permaculture. Let me, if I may, just plug a few coming events. This Saturday, we're going to have Jasenka, um, a Bosnian woman who's going to speak to white privilege. Um, she's, that's going to be on uh, 3 o'clock on Saturday, an hour earlier than we usually do it. Um, and then after that, I'm going to speak on a philosopher um, who's also from Jamaica. <laughs> you know, we got to rep our people. Um, Charles Mills and his, his way of approaching um, race. And uh, so it's called ripping, ripping Up the Racial Contract, Charles Mills and um, Critical Race Theory in, in Philosophy. Um, so those are our next two coming talks. We're working on February. Uh, March is starting to come together. It's looking very uh, interesting. So today we have a talk on the environment. Um, environmental justice is one of those pieces that we need to pay more attention to. So I give you Albert Brown. Thank you, Aaron. Glad everybody could be here today. And um, so I want to speak a little bit about the history of permaculture. It's a word that a lot of people don't know or haven't heard before. It's a newer word. It's only been coined since uh, the early 70s, Permaculture One, um, which was the seminal paper that this whole kind of worldwide body of knowledge uh, spawned from, started in Australia. It was the work of two men, uh, David Holmgren and Bill Mollison. Now, this is considered the Bible of permaculture, but there are now hundreds of books. I'm going to pass this around. And just a, just a glance over this, you'll see just the depth of knowledge that goes into uh, this new science. Um, so I want to define permaculture for you as a word. Um, I'm going to pass this around. Maybe if you want to take a look at it, um, I'll, I'll define it. So permaculture is a body of knowledge that directly studies natural systems, patterns, and outcomes. Permaculture designers then integrate this understanding into a design that interfaces between human culture and nature. So ba the, the basic idea is, um, you know, in our group we, we often talk about being conscious of our actions and occupying the we're, we're trying to always bring consciousness. Um, and so uh, permaculture seeks to bring human attention into a more conscious awareness of what is actually happening into uh, in the environment itself. Let me give you a quick example, okay? The way housing is done today, for example, say I bought a lot, a one acre lot, and I plan to build my dream house on it. The way it's done today is I walk up to this lot and I think to myself, I'm gonna put this plan that I designed on there. I don't even look at the space. It's just a blank page that I've already created to design in my mind. I pay no attention to nature at all, none. All I see is just bulldoze it out of the way and let's get this house built. So that's the way we think now. Now permaculture seeks to change that thinking significantly so that we walk up to the space that we're about to interact in for years going forward and we study it. We interact with it before we take any action. We actually notice the patterns, the guilds, and I'll get into that in a few minutes. We notice what species are there. We notice um, any kind of formations, any kind of mineral uh, formations, any, where, where the hydrology is, you know, where is water run. We, we pay attention before we do anything. And we let nature work with us and us work with nature to create a more harmonious design and in the end a much more abundant design, which I think will be evident as we move forward. So uh, the word permaculture means permanent human culture joined with agriculture. Uh, some, of the, some of the overarching principles of permaculture are diversity, stability, and resilience. So any design you create has to manifest those values. Um, and permaculture was founded on a set of principles and ethics. Before I get into the principles, I'm gonna go into the ethics because I think the ethics directly relate to our occupation. And I had the joy today of um, about five years, oh, let's see, no, 
longer than that. Twelve years ago, because Bhakti was a poem. Bhakti, Bhakti was in Bhakti's belly at the time. So about 13 years ago, I was at an intentional community outside of Eugene, Oregon, called Lost Valley Educational Center. And I was there helping, hi Stephanie, I was there helping them with their community uh, in, uh, in both uh, organic food production and some energy stuff. Um, and we were using permaculture design principles for the community. So one thing I did today was I went back there, because they teach permaculture courses there. It's one of the places you can go and get certified at, you know, after a certain number of weeks to be a permaculture designer. So I went on there today just to see if I saw, you know, just to look at it. And what I noticed is that permaculture has now evolved even farther than when it was when, when I was studying it a lot, was uh, they have a new form of social design called sociocracy. And sociocracy is, is based on permaculture. It's taking permaculture principles and integrating them into human interactions uh, beyond just the human and natural world interface, actually the human-human interface, using the very same principles I'm about to go over. So I found that very interesting that because um, we are now including in our designs things like biomimicry, which means to take, to observe nature in a way that you start to mimic what it does. And why would we do that? Why would we mimic nature and not just do our own thing, right? Because up to this point, science hasn't found anything that surpasses nature. Nature has zero waste, zero. Human beings don't have zero waste. Uh, human creations. Yeah. Yeah. Human creations, human constructions, human civilization, especially Western civilization, is largely, and capitalism itself has built into it waste. So, um, so nature doesn't do that. So now some scientists are smart enough to start doing things like uh, biomimicry, which is mimic natural systems for all kinds of applications. But uh, now permaculture is being used within human communities to help. Uh, do things similar to what we're doing in this dome, which is facilitation of meetings. So this sociocracy is a new term I learned just about an hour ago, looking at this old commune that I hung out at. And sociocracy is taking permaculture and working with those principles with people. So let's go into the ethics a little bit. So the, it's ba there's three primary ethics that are taught in all permaculture design courses. They, they are earth care, people care, and fair share. Um, so, uh, and these are, this is my own understanding of this, um, and you'll find different understandings, but those are the basic ones. So earth care, we'll start with that. Acknowledging the earth as the source of all life, realizing our interdependence with the earth and its nature as a primary ethic. Meaning that if we don't take care of the, of the natural systems around us, then what we are doing is we are, he uh, hastening our own demise, we're hastening our own problems, we're creating problems for ourselves. Everything we're wearing right now, this dome that we're sitting in, the heat that's coming out of that uh, heater right there, everything we're using, all the technology we're using, everything comes from this earth, everything. And we happen, and we were talking about uh, environmental justice uh, a few moments ago when Heron was introducing this talk. So in terms of justice, we are, you know, some of us are aware that every major life system on Earth is either in demise or collapse or has collapsed. So there is no major life system on Earth that is considered fully healthy, fun healthy functioning right now. That's what should be alarming to every human being who hears that statistic. One example is there's 200 tigers. Yeah, exactly. Another example is the fisheries. A lot of people don't know that uh, for the last uh, last year it was the first year in American history that the West Coast salmon fishery was shut down and nobody was allowed to catch a single salmon on the West Coast. Not one. We're legal anyway. That's never happened before. Ever. And why did that happen? Because the salmon fishery, the population is in collapse. The same thing has happened in the Atlantic Ocean. The Canadian fishery, which is considered probably on the Atlantic, off of Nova, of Nova Scotia and Newfoundland, is considered the richest, one of the richest fisheries on Earth. Haddock, um, cod, um, these type of, you know, your mainstay, you know, when you go and have your fish fry on Friday, those, that's where they came from, and that, that fishery. That fishery is under major collapse right now, and, and they have severely limited all fishing in that area. So, the, I'm just, and I'm just talking about the oceans, and I could, go, I could go point by point through seven other fisheries around the world that are in collapse. That's just the fisheries. Now let's talk about the forests. 
Uh, in the United States alone, it used to be said that a squirrel could jump from a tree in Maine and make it all the way to Florida without ever touching the ground. Because when white settlers first came or started really uh, in a large scale uh, settlement of the Americas in the 1700s, it was all forested. The entire East Coast, from the plains to the Atlantic Ocean, from Maine down to Georgia, was just one solid, continuous, old growth forest. 99% of it is gone and is not coming back. So it, it, you can see how wherever humans unintelligently settle in an area, and, and if they're not connected to these kind of ethics like earth care, they start to destroy their own land base. There's nothing more valuable than a land base, nothing. Anybody who tells you that a piece of gold or a piece of paper with some ones and zeros on it in George Washington's face is more valuable than your land base is somebody who's not connected to reality. The only reality we have on this planet, the ground of reality, is nature itself. It isn't religion, it isn't philosophy, the ground of nature is our reality. And if we don't have that fundamental understanding, we will continue to harm ourselves and each other. So earth care is extremely important. It's the first of the eth permaculture ethic principles. Taking care consciously of the bioregion you live in. And one of the things that we, we teach in permaculture is that every person should know their bioregion. What is your bioregion? Your bioregion is your hydrology, your uh, mineralogy, and your um, your forestry, what the, your land base. So you should know where uh, you know what are the major rivers in this area, the lake. You should know where what creeks flow into what. You should know what are the major tree species, the dominant tree species, the guilds in your communities. We should be aware of these things, but we're not. We're cut off from them. So we ask you, questions. Yes. What's a guild? A guild. I'm about to come to that. So a guild is any. Could you repeat uh, the three things you said? Hydrology. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, hydrology. It goes beyond this. It's going to get into topology. It's going to get into uh, soil, but uh, geology. Uh, and and your in your in your land base, which would be either uh, around here, it's going to be a matrix hardwood forest because we're this is a this is a forested area. So in our our biology, geology land base. Yes, our um, uh, our bioregion right here basically is the Allegheny Plateaus. That's what it's called. So in, in just in case you didn't know, is it um, the, the scientific word for the, the temperate forest? Yes, deciduous temperate forest. Yep. Okay, so, so earth care, taking care of your land base, number one. Number two, people care. Working cooperatively to find solutions to meet basic human needs and building healthy societies. Pretty simple, right? But again, it's something we don't practice. Um, working cooperatively, right there. There's a, huge, there's a huge difference from the way we work in this society, which is we work competitively. We don't cooperate to meet basic human needs. We com com compete to accumulate wealth and status. So right there, we are, we're not in an ethical alignment with each other or our land base, because we're not working co co uh, cooperatively with each other. We're not meeting basic needs of everybody. If you can't hold yourself up or compete, we leave you behind. You're, you're left behind, you know? Um, so in, in other societies, it's even worse. So, but but it's, such, it's just good to know. So taking care of people, taking care of your, your, your land base and taking care of people. Basic ethics of permaculture. And then fair share. And I think this one, I mean, all of these relate to the Occupy movement, but I think this one by far is the most important in terms of uh, our occupation. Regulating greed and wasteful consumption, ensuring that people and natural resources are not exploited, but rather treated wisely. I agree. I, what, do you, what do you say to that? I, mean, I think that pretty much says it all. <laughs> Um, I'm just going to read it again because I love this ethic. Yeah, it's, very nice. it's called fair share, and it means it, it, it's basically regulating greed and wasteful consumption. I have to go once. So you too, go. Ensuring that people and natural resources are not exploited but treated wisely. So those are the ethic, the ethical and philosophical foundations for the principles you're about to hear about. And again, uh, permaculture basically is a design course. It teaches human beings how to be designers uh, on projects interacting with each other and with their land base. So we'll start with number one. The most, this is the most important principle of, of, of a design is observe and interact. 
Again, spend time uh, directly perceiving the nature that you're working with, using your senses and intellect, then act in a harmonious way with the natural evolution patterns um, and designs that you're, you're, you're encountering. Uh, number one, just always observe first. So one of the things, you know, you can, and you can apply this again because of this new term, sociocracy, you can apply this right to what this meeting right now, right? So uh, how many of us have been in very intense Occupy movement meetings, OB meetings, when there's something very important being discussed, we're very far along into the discussion, and somebody walks into the room, has not participated for the last two and a half hours, does not wait, does not listen, does not sit down, does not try to find out what's going on, just starts pronouncing on top of what's going on. 